As you were talking a few minutes ago about the Semitic languages and the scriptures, the Arabic and the Hebrew, yeah. how, how does that correlate to the Nuwabic language? All right, what people always want to know is why is there so much Arabic or Hebrew in Nuwabic? The truth is that the people called the Hikat Hasus or the Hyksos were from the Canaanite tribe. The Canaanite tribes migrated into Egypt around the 15th dynasty and stayed in here for 430 years. While there, of course, they took on the Egyptian culture. And they also took on some of the language and dialect. And then they migrated back out of here and went back to the land of Canaan, set up the city of Kadesh. And now they had this new dialect they were speaking that was different from the original Aramic or Ugaric, different from the original uh, Akkadian, different from the original cuneiform script. They had something that had new words because they were in a new environment. And for instance, if I never was exposed to sand, if I came to a place where there is no sand, and I spoke a certain language, when I got here and I asked this young lady, or oh, I asked you, oh, what is this stuff here, you know? What is this? You would say, sand. And I'd go, say that again. Sand. I go, sand. Sand. And I go back to my people and say, and I met this man. And the man said, and I said, and I met this man. And he said, and I 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 said, and called sand. I can't translate it to my language. I have to say called Tana sand. So now, other guys who are there for my language, as they go up and talk, they say, you know, what's name talk about some white flaky stuff called everything and everything is in the language until they come to the word sand. So when a group of people migrate to another place, and they start seeing things in other languages that pertain to that place, they graft it into their language. Plus you have what's called a dialect. The pronunciation is usually shot. <laughs> you follow? So now what happens is you have Egyptians. Let me go back further than that for everybody, if, you, if I may. When you're reading the Bible, in Genesis chapter 2, they speak about the rivers of Pisan and Gihon. The word Pisan is broken into two words, Pis and On. The, I should have said it in Hebrew, Pis, not Pis. <laughs> pis On and Gihon On. And Gihon is really saying Gish On. On is the deity of what? Heliopolis of Egypt. So those two rivers are actually in the Torah, in the Old Testament, have two Egyptian names, but they're making it look like that these are Hebrew names, but they admit that Abraham was first called Hebrew in Genesis chapter 13. So they know where in the world those rivers have been in Hebrew names, but the language didn't exist yet. So therefore, anything between from Genesis 13 back, anybody's name you got is Egyptian. That's interesting, because Ibrahim was the first one called Hebrew. And they called him Ibrit, which is the way to say Hebrew, simply because he crossed the Tigris to create his valley. And the word Ibrit means to come from one side to the other, to cross over. So the people on the other side spoke a language. And they said to him, Da Ibrit, or behold the Ibrit, the man who crossed over. So therefore, the very word Hebrew is not even Hebrew. The man he was talking to were Phoenicians, because they lived between the Tigris and Euphrates Valley. So the word Ivrit, Hebrew, is a Phoenician word, not a Hebrew word. You see what I'm saying? So now here we are, back in Genesis, where they speak about the land of Cush, because they say that the goal of that land, good, and they use the word Ethiopia in Genesis, way back in Genesis 2. But Cush was not born until Genesis chapter 10. <laughs> and if Cush was not born until Genesis chapter 10, who was the Cush being mentioned in Genesis chapter 2? This implies that those people that they say lived near the tribe of Euphrates Valley, that the flood that they say applies 
as the law really took place in Egypt. The mounts of Ararat was not over there in Persia, it was in Egypt. And that's why they've been digging in Persia for the last 2,000 years and haven't found the ark. They can dig for another 2,000 years and they won't find the ark. But they have found many arks or many jets along the Nile. And the Nile used to run straight up and it sprinkles into the Mediterranean Sea and then goes straight into the Persian Gulf. You know what I'm saying? So you think of a flood exploding upward and the tide and the Nile moves from down in South Africa upward. If an ark was built there, it would lift it up, take it through the Mediterranean where it spreads off, then it would go off. It would follow the tide off into the mountains. But, next point, Cush, the name, Ethiopia, is mentioned in Genesis 2, and Cush wasn't born until Genesis 10. Then the word Ham. Many scholars, especially the Greeks who visit there, they didn't call the place Egypt first. They called the place Hemet, or Kemet, or Hemi. And that's the same as the word Ham, who's related to Cush. You see? Now the Bible tells us that the Egyptians, and whenever it uses the word Egyptian, they use the word Mitzrayim. They use the word Mitzrayim. They say that Mitzrayim was in Egypt. But they don't speak of the migration of Mitzrayim from Sumeria to Egypt. Because what happened is they have to trace how they left Egypt went over to the Middle East, and then returned back home. And that's why you have the pre-dynastic period of people coming back in, trying to fight for their land. And the Phoenicians and them are fighting to get back in Egypt, because they're trying to get back in, but they had already been out there in the land of King Anne and mixing with the Canaanites. So the Egyptians didn't accept them, because they were mixed, and they were trying to keep their so-called bloodline pure because they believe in succession by blood relatives the same way we do the Bible. You know what I'm saying? The son, the father, son. So they couldn't have tribes who went off and mixed. And that's why if you look in the Bible, in the story of Jacob and Esau, Esau, you find as soon as Esau gets mad because his birthright is taken, first he's up going to marry some Edomites. He was thought he was getting even with Isaac by saying, well, because Isaac gave Jacob my rights, I'm just going to marry out my tribe. That was a big thing. So the Egyptians, who were people of the Bible, same people, had the same law. And they did not want to mix seed back in. So the Hichet Hasus came back in, fought their way in, gradually took over, and set up. And didn't get put out until Atmos, and then rose up against them and chased them which were the original Israelites. You speak about the uh, Hyksos, that was the original Israelites in Egypt, pushed them out back to the land. So you'll find, therefore, that the languages got mixed. So the ancient Semitic languages are coming out of ancient Egypt, and thus Arabic is going to have words in it that sounds like Arabic or Hebrew, because they came from mixing with Egyptians, and then took it back to the Middle East. Okay? Uh, Rahu Bat. Um, I'm an Eastern star, and um, okay. and I was um, wondering, as I seek to become a daughter of Isis, um, how did I seek to become a daughter of Isis? Take your time. I'm kind of nervous, right. excuse me. I seek to become a daughter of Isis. Um, Let me say this. If you are an Eastern star, then you're already a daughter of Isis. Especially if you intend to become one. Okay. Because everybody's heart is there before their body. <laughs> Trust me, I just want to say, I, I figured I'd be helping you. <laughs> just to relax. Um, what are my goals so far as becoming an Eastern star and so far as um, with the shrine? Lady Shriners. Lady Shriners. The Lady Shriners' job is the same as ours. You have to help us find Mary. And where Mary is going to give birth to Jesus on earth. And we have to be there to create a circle around him. 
and you have to be there to help us. The same way Fatima went out into the field to protect her father when he was struck down. Your job is just as hard as ours. And that's why the Eastern Stars doctrine is based on Christianity, much more than information. Most of your teachings in Eastern Stars are based on that star from the East, the star that who acknowledged? Was it the Christians, the Jews who acknowledged the star? Who, who acknowledged the star? Who followed the star? The wise men. Now, the wise men are thought of to be three men who stepped into the time of history, did a great act, and then just disappeared. Is that not right? Stepped in, went to the manger, saw the child who they referred to not as God, but as a king, Melek, looked down at him, gave gifts, and took and went and met a uh, Herod. When they found out that Herod had a scheme to kill Jesus, they went back and told Jesus, Joseph, Herod is getting ready to kill your son. Then they went back to Herod, Herod asked him, did you see the boy? He said, no, we ain't seen him. Right? And then, Joseph was visited by an extraterrestrial, which is called an angel in the Bible. Angelos just means a messenger. Angelos. A messenger from God came down, it says. Came from somewhere now. I can get touchy here too. And went to Joseph and told Joseph, you take my son, God says, take my son out of this city and take him to Egypt and sojourn there until Herod dies. With me? Are you ready for the upset? Huh? Why was that necessary? Why was that at all necessary? Why would God have to hide his son? Why couldn't God just wave his hand and nobody touch his son? Was it predestined as most Christians teach that Jesus would be raised to the age of 33 and then crucified? If that was predestination, then why would they have to move Jesus out of uh, Bethlehem? Because it was predestined by God and God's plan. There's nobody under the heavens and earth that could have did anything to that point. So if God had to tell them through the angel to take Jesus off to Egypt and hide him, then God knew that Jesus could die there. So is there a point when Jesus the man became God-like? Yes. And when was that point? When he met with John the Baptist. And John the Baptist took him to the Jordan. You follow that? And there he was what? Baptized. For what? The removal of his sins. And what happened when the skies opened? An angel descended in the form of a dove and heaven spoke and said what? Behold, this is mine in whom I am well. And it says the spirit lighted down on him in the form of a dove. And he was filled of the... That's right. <laughs> then he was God the spirit and God the man. Because then the power of God had moved out of heaven in a symbolic form of a dove and settled on him. Then death and destiny took a change. Prior to that, Jesus was as vulnerable to life and death as everybody else. Otherwise, there would have been no reason whatsoever to have him moved from Jerusalem to go all the way to Egypt. Because nobody could have touched him. If destiny said he would be crucified at a certain time and raised from the cross. No one would have been able to touch him. I don't care what they thought or what they wanted to do. Because no one can defy the power of God. Is that right? So if that had to be done in that manner, that was a confession that Jesus wasn't always God, but that Jesus was a man. And that's very important, y'all. You know why? Because when you get to the cross story, that same power of God must have left Jesus while on the cross. Now you may not believe that, but Jesus himself did, because Jesus said, my God, my God, what? Why have thou, and you know what the word sabachthani means in Hebrew? Left or departed from me, sabachthani. My God, Eli, Eli, you know what Eli means? On high, on high, Lemma, why have you so that him? left me? He was now on the cross, a man again. Could suffer. And so he said, 
I thirst. And that was a sign. He said, I'm thirsty. <laughs> and uh, the mockery said, well, if you be the son of God, uh, why don't you just come down off the cross? See, that's the same type of temptation they gave him before. <laughs> he was standing over the mountain. And the devil said, well, if you be the son of God, why don't you cast yourself down and God will catch you? And he said, well, get behind me, Satan. Because it's written, you shall serve the Lord thy God, and him alone shall you serve. You don't tempt God. So Jesus couldn't come down off the cross on the temptation of a mortal. Could he have stepped off the cross? Could he have jumped off the cliff? That's not important. The end result is what's important. He didn't. You understand what I'm saying? The whole story is being fed to us now. The devil is already inside the churches, inside the mosques. It has crept in in the hearts of people and spread their venom. And preachers and teachers who haven't taken the time to study the languages, to get into the etymology of it, the meanings of the words, who haven't traveled to the spots and saw them with their own eyes, but they want to have a big church and a big following and do a whole lot of youth and hollering but don't have, they don't teach, they preach. I don't want to be a preacher. I want to be a teacher. And I don't want to read preachers. I want to breed teachers. I want those teachers to be people that don't believe anything. They check it out. They question anybody. And I tell you, don't believe nothing I say. I'm a nut. I'm a lunatic. Especially if you ask the media here. <laughs> That's because they're afraid of the truth. Because the truth and only the truth shall make you free. Not set you free. It'll make you get up off your butt and free yourself. You ain't gonna just lay into freedom. You're gonna, use this, you're gonna use this truth, and this truth is gonna lift you above the mental slavery that keeps you in the state of mind that you're worthless. So that's what the truth will do to you. You with me? Any other question? As a shrine, I was wondering in the, in the sacred lodges or in the temples, using uh, in, the, in the Quran, using El, uh, El Fatiha. El Fatiha, yes. yes. I want to know about the, you know, the pronunciation of it and the meaning and, and the way it originally comes from. Okay. Um, Surah Al Fatiha is used as the opening chapter. The very name, Al Fatiha, Fatiha means to open something. Like Jesus said, I open and no man shall it. But that's not the original name of the chapter. When the Muslims rewrote the Quran, they put that name there. The real name of the chapter is Alhamdulillah. To be grateful and have gratitude. And it's pronounced Bismillahir Rahman Al Rahim. Alhamdulillahir Rabbil Alameen. Al Rahman Al Rahim. Maliki Yawm Al Deen. Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'i. Ahdina Al Sirat Al Mustaqeem. Sirat Al Azeen Amta Alayhim. Ghayr Al Maghdubi Alayhim. And that whole chapter is broken up into three basic principles. One is, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. That means to say, all gratitude and thanks, Billahi, is for Allah, who is the source, the Rabbil Alameen, the sustainer of all the boundless universes, Alamma. Is what the word is. So they say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Then we say, Ar Rahman Rahim. And that means Rahama. The root of that word Rahama is from Arham, meaning the womb of a woman. But it's been translated to mean gracious and merciful. But it really says that we pass through by the grace of Allah, we pass through the woman. That's his grace and his mercy. Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. Who is he? Maliki Yomidin. Who? Maliki Yomidin. He is the Malik, the Ahlek, the ruler, the master, the sustainer. Maliki Yomidin. Of the day when all men, women, and things will be judged. 
يا فاضل إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين Yeah, it's you alone we seek for our help. <clears throat> Guide us to this path. Put me on your path, God Almighty. And put me on that path and make it so straight and narrow that I can't get off of it. I'm a weak mortal. I can fall. <clears throat> get me on the mustaqeem. I'll make it so I'm like a robot in your way, God. Nothing can leave me. I don't want to be like those people who have gone astray. All those people who have brought your wrath on them. Or those who dollar, who got off that path. I want to be on those people who stay there, to think and think, to up and down, to write in the hearts, want to stay on your path. I don't want to be in the path of a prophet. I don't want to be in the path of a seer or a mystic. I want to be on the path of God. And God alone. And that's what makes Islam so weird. Because Muslims are on the path of Muhammad. When the quote says, Awudu billahi min shaitan al rajim Bismillahi al-Rahman al-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen al-Rahman al-Rahim. Maliki yawmiddin. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. تهدينا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين. يقول آمين. آمين no means so be it. آمين comes out to me you can trust what I just said. You can believe me, God, I'm with you. You follow? So when shrine is open, the large temple with that coat. They're mocking something. If they don't understand an Arabic language, it's wrong. They need people to come around and set the record straight. Because it ain't no joke. It's a heck of a commitment. And then they say, well, we don't really believe in Islam, but use names like Allah, Arab, and different words that shoveled around in Arabic in the shrine is taboo. And they bring a raft upon themselves. A raft of Allah. You know? Over. Does time go forward or backward? Time doesn't go anywhere. Time doesn't move. Motion and time is an illusion. Like this sister over here, who's actually over there, because I'm over here. When I get over there, she's still gonna be right there. But now I'm over here, there is still over there, you know. The question is where? Because I need a point of origin for you to find out where there is once I leave there. So let me get back over there. <laughs> Which is now here. And she's now there. Where are we? Here. <laughs> to someone else, where's here? There. Time is a concoction on a wall. It doesn't go any place. It has little arms on it, moving around in circles. It gives you the impression that time is moving forward or backwards. Tomorrow does never get here. Because when tomorrow comes, you call it, and today will be, and the next day after that, there'll be another yesterday, so it's all one big yesterday, all one big tomorrow, all one big today, and they all come out to be now. So there's no such thing as time moving one direction or backwards. Please remove that concept. And for those who think they understand astronomy and say, well, in actuality, does not the planet move around the sun? Oh, yes, it does. And for that small moment and that illusion, you can fool yourself into thinking you're going somewhere unless you step back away from this solar system and look at the sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and and then see, it ain't going nowhere. You know, you're inside there, moving around in circles. You ain't going nowhere, laying in your bed, your digestive system is working, but you ain't going nowhere. So they had to tell us that time is that way and that there's a past and that there is a future. And let me make this clear. That when, and this is the next question, that when John in the book of Revelations had a vision of the future, a prophecy, he saw it. You with me? He saw it. He saw 
the vision. He witnessed the vision. He woke up crying the same way you do with a nightmare. He felt the vision. You know why? Because that's when it was happening. As he was imagining it, imagine images, as he was getting images in his mind of the events of the prophecy of the book of Revelations back in the year 96, it was happening then. Or he couldn't have imagined it. And if he saw the animals and saw the beasts rising out the water with the seven heads, and if he saw that that vivid, then it was happening if in no other place in his head. And if it happened in his head, it happened. It may have not happened in your head, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. Because it did happen somewhere in space and time, but in his head. John. So there's no prophecy that's coming from the past forward. They're all here. You follow? You don't have to go seek your ancestors. Your ancestors are looking right at you. Your relative to the past on, as you say, it's a nice word, past, because you get the impression that it went that way. They haven't gone nowhere. They're right here. They hear you. They're talking to you. They're communicating with you daily. You just have closed yourself off because of religious dogma and say, I ain't going to communicate with my grandmother because that would be sacrilegious. According to whose doctrine? According to whose doctrine? Because it's definitely not Jesus' doctrine. Because Moses and Elijah were Jesus' relatives, and they came to him and talked to him in a transfiguration period. So ain't nothing wrong with you talking to your ancestors or talking to your grandmother. See, somewhere on the line, someone came in and defined doctrine. They defined religion. They defined it for us, and they gave us their interpretation. You understand? I, I, like I said in the beginning, a couple weeks ago, in the beginning, in the beginning, in the beginning. You know that? I was trying to stir a thought in my mind that if God was in the beginning, right, then that wasn't the beginning. Because if God said let there be light, then God was already there. So that was a beginning, not the beginning. There's a difference in a beginning and the beginning. Every child born into the world is a beginning. But no child born into the world is the beginning. So if God was there to say let there be light, that was not the beginning. That was in the beginning. Not at the very beginning. Are you hearing me? That's what I was talking about.